Please be seated. I want to wish a mother, happy Mother's Day to those of you and happy Grandparents' Day to some of you. This is my favorite time of the year, I think. Springtime, Mother's Day, Father's Day, Grandparents' Day, uh, Cubs baseball, uh, good weather. There are school activities, graduations, many things that pull us together as family and give us time of celebration. And usually there's some good sweets along the way, which I have to stay away from. But it's part of the things that are going on in our lives, and it's a special time. And we take a break today from our study of Daniel. We'll go to chapter 6 next week. I wanted to spend time honoring God first as we honor Mother second and encourage all of us to have an appreciation for, for those things in our life and those people in our life who've meant so much to us. Galatians 1 verse 24 is an interesting verse that I discovered this past week. It says, And they glorified God because of me. And it just reminds us that we glorify God through people that God puts in our lives. We glorify God on Mother's Day because of the person that He's put in each of our lives. It's a special day if you have a Christian mother and if she's still alive, it's a very blessed day. Spend time remembering some of the things from your past, remembering the things done for you by mom, and certainly remember those things in a way that would honor her, and that's the goal. We look back in history, and it seems like every two or three years as I have been preaching, I finished my 37th year of ministry this Friday. Uh, begin a new year of ministry on Friday. It seems like those times have gone by very quickly. And from time to time, as we come to a day like today, it seems appropriate to take just a moment to at least acknowledge where the idea of Mother's Day came from. It's not from the card companies. You know that more money is spent on Mother's Day on cards and flowers and candies and other things like that than on Father's Day, but that's understandable. Uh, this isn't a card company day. Someone several years ago, uh, Anna Jarvis, began honoring her mother and giving her a corsage and doing things to honor her mother. And the first time that the thing became known by others was May the 10th, 1908. But others began picking up the idea. And we see from history that an act of Congress on May the 9th, 1914, President Woodrow Wilson proclaimed the second Sunday of May as officially Mother's Day. It seemed like it made sense. Pick a time, give honor, and do it as a nation. We don't have Monday off. Uh, there's a point where we have to work, and mothers never have a day off, so why should we declare a day when the children will be home and maybe the husband will be home on the day after she's been honored and has to work double? It makes sense to me that there's not a day off after Mother's Day that would require more from her, but it is a time that our nation has given honor and deference to that special circumstance. Why do we like holidays so much? Bob Young gave me an idea as he was preaching on Mother's Day a number of years ago. He says there's nostalgia, there's tradition, there's heritage. It's a time when we merge the past and the present and the future. It's a time when we celebrate, we look backward with insight, we look around in awareness, we look to the future with hope, we become more confident in times of celebration, we become more loving, we become better. And I like those words. There's something positive in so many areas of our life when we stop and we choose to celebrate an event, a person in our life, all of those good things come from it. 
Others on days like today, I look back when we spent 12 plus years at one congregation in South Florida, it really gets difficult after about four Mother's Day to preach another Mother's Day sermon when you've been at the same place for several times. I managed over each of those times to share something new, though some of it was circled up a little bit different or approached a little bit different. But many times we go to a statement Paul made as he was honoring Timothy and he was charging Timothy in ministry. And he says in 2 Timothy 1 verse 3, I think God whom I serve as did my ancestors with a clear conscience as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. As I remember your tears, I long to see you that I may be filled with joy. Wonderful words describe the relationship of Paul to a young man that he helped to convert. He says, I'm reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now, I am sure, dwells in you as well. Some of us are blessed to have grandparents and parents who introduced us to God from the first moment we breathe. And even as I say that, that's not really true. Because my mother, I know, and my children's mother, Terry, were singing scriptures and singing songs to them before they were actually born. Reading scripture, preparing for that moment of birth, but wanted to set that environment even before that conception and that birth had taken place. And so Paul is acknowledging that we as parents and mothers today must have a sincere faith. It means something that just says it's real and they know it's real. And there's a sincerity about it so that they see it for what it is. And then as a result of seeing what they should see, of experiencing as children, Timothy then, he says, you now, because of grandmother, because of mother, you too have that sincere faith. And I can say this as a son, the second of nine children, my parents wanted more than anything for me to love God, to put Him first in my life, to seek to follow those principles as taught at church, as the ecclesia gathered together, and to put those principles in my life day by day. And I've told my children many, many times, I hope you have as well, and I'm sure you've heard it, those of us who are older. You've heard mom and dad, and you've heard grandparents and grandparents, uh, granddaddy and grandmother say on many occasions, Whatever you do in life is not as important as being a Christian first. A Christian first. I heard that expression so many times. There were times when I knew I would run in the 1906, uh, actually 1972 Olympics when I was running track in high school. It's amazing how quickly that dream fades away when you don't even win the state championship race that you run. You want to be a hockey player. Gregory want to be a hockey player. The things that we want to be as children and our parents saying to us genuinely, sincerely, whatever you decide to do, you can do it. In this country, there's so many things offered to us, but be a Christian first. Be a Christian doctor. Be a Christian history teacher. Be a Christian fireman or sheriff. Be a Christian, whatever it is. And I'm certain Paul knew that Timothy had heard that often. And those words would speak to us. Have a sincere faith that will be seen and heard and accepted and practiced by those who follow it. There are many times prayers are written. I'm not one to ever read prayers. I was taught early that prayer can be simple. It has a beginning and an end and some things in the middle. But I want to read you a prayer that someone wrote that might be prayed on such an occasion. 
It would say, Dear Lord, thank you for this child that I call mine, not my possession, but my sacred charge. Teach me patience and humility so that the best I know may flow in its being. Let me always remember parental, parental love is my natural instinct, but my child's love must ever be deserved and earned. That for love I must give love. For understanding I must give understanding. For respect I must give respect. That as I was the giver of life, so must I be the giver always. Help me to share my child with life and not to clutch at it for my own sake. Give courage to do my share to make this world a better place for all children and especially my own. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. It would say to us that that child is not only precious, but they're given to us for a very short time. And we need to make the most use of that time. It's amazing the things we hear that we never really know where they came from. And it's equally amazing how many times in our rearing at home when we're thinking to ourselves, I'm never going to do that. I'm never going to do what mom and dad did when I was there. And many times, shock, shock, shock. We see ourselves and hear ourselves using the exact words that we heard, sometimes saying, I'll never do that. And sometimes we'll lay some of those things aside that weren't something that was pleasant, wasn't done in quite the method that we would have chosen. But more times than not, we do and say so much of what we heard and saw as children. My children tell me how often they hear my words coming out of their mouth. How often they tell Terry, Mom, I was saying today exactly what you used to say. They didn't plan it, it happens. But that's the process of living with people day by day. And be careful, it would say, to be sure the things you're saying are those things which can be repeated and can be useful in years and years ahead. But it's a reminder that we are put in charge only for a short time. And obedience has to be a part of each home. We live at a time when it's looked upon as something that maybe you won't choose. And I've always said that giving a child a spanking is not designed to hurt. That should never be the goal. You do whatever you have to do to get their attention and to keep it. And if it's a slap on the leg or a ping pong paddle on the seat, do it only to get the attention and then take advantage of that to say and teach and impress upon them in every way possible that this is important. We talked about the value of a name, the names that God has. Yahweh this morning and the impression that we want to give upon our children whatever you say and do as you leave this home today as they get older especially you wear my name you wear your mother's name you wear your grandparents name and that should mean something to you sometimes that's a principle that's enough to say it because they don't want to embarrass grandma or grandpa. They don't want to embarrass mother or dad. They honor the name by leaving and going into the community and not wanting to bring shame to that name. And certainly if it occurs, it can be undone. Because the community knows we're only human. And they certainly know our children are only human. Because so are theirs. And things can be said and undone and certainly before God repented of to where we're, we're white as snow again. And as I told someone recently, and again, and again, and again, and again, and again. And I could have kept saying that for an hour and it would still be true. But we wear someone's name. We need to give it reverence in our actions and thoughts and we need to give a reverence to that name as we go into the community. 
Proverbs 13, 24, He who withholds his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him diligently. The word discipline in its Hebrew and Greek root is the concept of teaching. You're teaching them through a diligent method that which they need to hear. Discipline from a standpoint of not sparing the rod is, a, is something that is used hopefully as a last resort when some other things haven't worked. When time out, grounding, taking away privileges as they get older, there's a number of things that occur but it, when all is said and done, usually the sparing the rod would be the last action, not the first. But the teaching is a diligent teaching. Proverbs 19, 18, Discipline your son while there's hope, and do not desire his death. Do you realize I know of some when their children were turning against them and turning against godly principles at early ages? Some of them seven, eight, nine, and ten, and they just scared them to death. And because they knew the consequences of that continued action, that kind of willful rebellion, if it continued and certainly went forward with God, where they would spend eternity came into mind. Much too quick, much too early in the life of that individual. But the concern, if this continues, look what happens. And I'd rather not have a child than to have that as the end result. But that's the danger, if you will, or that's the risk that we take when we have children. We want them to make good choices. We want to follow principles that will take them into life, functioning properly, obedient to parents and others, and certainly stepping into eternity upon their death. So it's all involved there. It is by his deeds that a lad distinguishes himself if his conduct is pure and right. Proverbs 20, verse 11. Have you noticed something? I'm not sure I thought about it until this very moment. It seems like so many of the Proverbs are talking about the discipline that's necessary for the male child, the son. Maybe there's some habitual reality to that. I know it's certainly speaking to both. And any time your child or the children will not follow your, teacher, your teaching, you're in trouble and they're going to get in trouble. Furthermore, until you get your child to mind you, neither independence, good habits, work, communication, no togetherness will work for you and them. One of the things we're about is to teach them principles that work in the home so they can function in our society. You're not going to keep a job very long if you can't follow through with simple chores and have them increased as you grow in years and be obedient, not stealing, all the principles that are taught in a home that must be lived out in the workplace, in a community. And so it's, it's important for all of us to protect our community from our children of sorts, teaching the things that they should be taught so that they will then function in a way that is an appropriate way. I don't know where I found this. I laugh at it every time I go back to it. I haven't shared it with you, I don't think. It's a little saying entitled Trouble with Junior. Junior bit the meter man. Junior kicked the cook. Junior's antisocial now, according to the book. Junior smashed the clock and lamp. Junior hacked the tree. Destructive trends are treated in chapters 2 and 3. Junior threw the milk at mom. Junior screamed for more. Notes on self-assertiveness are found in chapter 4. So it's a parent who's reading a book on how to manage Junior. 
Junior tossed his shoes and socks out into the rain. Negation, that and normal, disregard the same, the book would say. Junior set Dad's shirt a fighter, salted Grandpop's tea, that to gain attention, see page 163, has a great ending. Grandpop, Grandpop sees the rod, yanked Junior across his knee. Grandpop hasn't read a book since 1993. Sometimes granddads just know, I'm not going to follow a book, I'm just going to put them over my knee and get their attention. It's not going to hurt, it's not for pain. It's the teaching, we don't act that way in my home. I love the principle, and sometimes books get in the way, but there's great value to them as well. But here's a saying that's a little more positive, and remember, one of the things we do is I come before you on an occasion like this. I want to honor God. I want to encourage Mom. I have to get a little sentimental. You see, that's part of the, of the uh, affection. That's part of the emotion that is appealing to those who are mothers. God knew there should be mothers to hear each infant's cry to pat away the little tears that fill a babe's eye. God knew there should be mothers to hear a child's first word, to listen with attention when a child's voice must be heard. God knew that each and every child needs someone close every day to help them out, to cheer them up at home, at school, at play to teach them how to share this world with sisters and with brothers and so in his great wisdom God created mothers and the value that they play in our homes certainly and in our society we just can't measure now something I have shared with you on a Mother's Day is the reason to have children why have children there are some who don't want to take the risk, and I talk to them in my life. In 37, soon to be 38 years of ministry, you talk to young people and they just don't want the pain and sorrow of the child who goes astray. And you encourage them to realize that's not always the case. And the beauty is God's in this with you. And the blessing is you get to have them day by day, week after month after year. And the prayers offered regularly, the life rendered consistently. And we know, statistics tell us, that if a Christian father and a Christian mother are at the church building every time the doors are open, you know what that means. There's something spiritually taking place. The odds are over 80% that that child will have those similar values as they pass through adulthood. The percentages are so high if it's a consistent action on the part of mom and dad. There are the 20% and that hurts. It hurts deeply. But the average, the reality, and the probability is very high if they see that in us. But the greatest reason I've seen, and I want to read it so as not to mess it up, why I have children? Because God has planted in me, you put the blank for you, the intense need to love and to care for someone else. There's an intense need on the part of you and your spouse that you want to take care of someone else. And you take the risk. You take the risk as a Christian of knowing they might not be faithful to that which you would want them to receive. You have an intense desire to take care of someone else. And one writer says the fullest human life is one that takes a chance on being committed to another human being. And that's exactly what it is. It's exactly what it is. It's 
And some would suggest it's 25 7, because somehow we have to come up with an extra hour on a regular basis to finish what God has given us to do when we have children and the life we live is so busy. My dad always took us to Psalm 127 and Psalm 128. These were read at his funeral. They'll be read at mom's funeral one day. Unless the Lord builds the house, its builders labor in vain. We pass over that too quickly. We can put forth the best of efforts, and it can be called labor, hard work, but it's vain work if God's not involved in it. Now that's understood on a Sunday morning in a church building when saints have gathered. That's understood. But sometimes it's not practiced during the week. You'll accept someone saying it here, but it's not practiced during the week. But your labor is in vain unless the Lord builds the house. The foundation, everything that you're about, everything that family's about, everything you want them to be today and in future days. It rotates, it gravitates, it involves God. And it's laboring in vain unless that's part of that which builds the house. And unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchmen stand guard in vain. In vain you rise early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat, for he grants sleep to those he loves. Sons are a heritage from the Lord, children a reward from him. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are sons born in one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be put to shame when they contend with their enemies in the gate. At the marriage seminar yesterday, Wayne, speaking to the men, says, you know, we think of this, and oh, our quiver was full of these arrows. They had five children, and he would relate to that occasionally. And he says, what someone forgot to tell me was an arrow has a sharp point at the end of it. As if to think, why did I have five? Sometimes he says, but we're so thankful. Let me give you a bill of rights. We live in a country that we understand a bill of rights. It's rights of children. Rosemond's bill of rights for children. Children have the right to find out early in their lives that their parents don't exist to make them happy but to offer them the opportunity to learn the skills they, children, will need to eventually make themselves happy. Children have a right to scream all they want to over the decisions that parents make, albeit their parents have the right to confine said screaming to certain areas of their homes. Children have the right to find out early that their parents care deeply for them, but don't give a hoot what their children think about them at any given moment in time. Because it is the most character building activity a child can engage in, children have the right to share significantly in the doing of household chores. And finally, children, or every child has the right to discover early in life that he isn't the center of the universe or his family or his parents lives, that he isn't a big fish in a small pond, and that he's not even in the total scheme of things very important at all. No one is so as to prevent them from becoming an insufferable brat. Now I read that a number of years ago, and my oldest daughter says, Dad, how could you read such a thing? I says, what do you mean? He says, it's telling you as a parent that your child's not the center of your life, at the center of your attention. And I said, that doesn't mean that if a child is crying, you don't respond to it and you don't care of their needs. They're dependent totally upon mom and dad. 
But it speaks of a general principle that as that child comes into the home, the reality is they soon will be leaving that home. And they must exist alone in this world. And then if they find a spouse, how much better it will be. But that child is not the center of attention at some point even between mom and dad. Because the last thing you want is for the child to leave home and a husband look across to a mother and not find a wife and there's no relationship there. Because the child has taken the center of the attention from the wife as the mother and neglect is given to that lasting relationship of a husband and wife. And she says, oh, I get it. But it's not easy to hear if you're a child. It's not easy to hear as a child, she told me. So I took a few extra minutes to explain what I think it's saying. And if you read those who help us in child rearing, that principle is taught so as to know that that child is part of a greater whole, a family. And each child is most important. And I remember a story of a son with a sister who it seemed to him was getting all the attention. And he was old enough to take mom into the room and say, don't you love me anymore? Don't you love me anymore? And the mother, understanding where it came from, sits down and says to the son, when you're sick, you get a lot of extra attention because you need it. Now, your sister is sick. And we need to give special attention to her. Maybe attention that you would otherwise receive. It's not a lack of love. We love both of you greatly. But sometimes things happen when one needs extra attention for a while. And that makes sense. The child could understand that. It's amazing how often when the sister gets sick that the brother pretends to be sick too so as to get some attention. <coughs> Mom, I think my throat's getting a little sore too. Could I have some jello too? We hear things like that because of this dynamic that's in play. In Psalm 128, blessed are those who fear the Lord as we said in class this morning, it's capital L-O-R-D, Yahweh, the personal close name of God, who walk in His ways. You will eat the fruit of your labor. Blessings and prosperity will be yours. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your home. Your sons will be like olive shoots around your table. Thus is the man blessed who fears Yahweh. And may Yahweh bless you from Zion all the days of your life. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem, speaking, of course, to Israel. And may you live to see your children's children. Peace be upon your nation. As I will ascribe that to us, peace be upon Israel, the actual reading. We learn some things at a marriage seminar Friday and Saturday. You'll hear them in coming months, I'm certain. Father's Day, Children's Day, Grandparents Day. Do you have a Children's Day on your calendar? Our children were pretty smart. When they were old enough to understand that the church was celebrating Mother's Day, and gifts were given, and going out to eat was given, and presents, and they saw Father's Day and presents and going out to eat or special things prepared. They look up at you going home on Father's Day and says, when's Children's Day? And we decided we're going to have a Children's Day. And it's a month after Father's Day. Grandparents' Day is now part of an official calendar in most of our environments. We'll honor a time as grandparents did during this summer season of honoring. But they figured out, consider 
if you still have children at home, of having a children's day. Have a children's day. I saw on Facebook this morning one of our members who said, honor Mother's Day, happy Mother's Day, but by the way, every day is Mother's Day. And there's a truth to that. A mother's work is never done. That saying is in our bulletin on purpose. But every day is a children's day. But to have a day to honor them is important. And I've got to share something that I found that's just too funny not to close with. A little boy forgot his lines in a presentation. It was a time when children at the Sunday school program or in the Sunday school program were doing something for their parents. His mother was in the front row to prompt him and she would gesture and she would form words quietly so as to help him not forget what he was supposed to say. But on this occasion, his son, her son's memory was just totally blank. Finally, she leaned forward and whispered the words to give him the cue that he would need. I am the light of the world. And she stood up and boldly says, My mother is the light of the world. Isn't it great if parents believe that? On Mother's Day, they should. And then we tell them, no, the story is Jesus is the light of the word, a world. But it makes a point that's worth hearing, doesn't it? We have such a great influence in the lives of our children. And I have encouraged more than a handful of people who came to faith late in their adult life who were not there as Christian mothers, as the Christian mother in the home. And I've encouraged them to go back and apologize to that adult child. Tell them what you wish you had known. And tell them you'd like to make up for it in ways now where possible. Repent of it if you need to as you would look at your circumstance. But the reality is it's never too late for a Christian to have an influence over another person. And for a Christian mother to have an influence over those who maybe she didn't over a period of time. Just because of how she came to faith. Take it, live it, honor God in that way, and put it squarely upon their shoulders. Because it's their responsibility to hear and act upon it and live according to what God would have them to live. I like what someone said here a few weeks ago. We have classes for all ages. I put in the bulletin last week, when the parents aren't here, neither are the children. And most of it needs to take place at home. But there are those here that want to come alongside and help you Teach and train your children. You stand first before God, accountable for that role that He's placed us in. And it's something we must take hold of. And then use others to also train and discipline, teach our children the things they should hear. This morning, as we close, the best thing I can say is to put God first in your life. Fathers, mothers, grandparents, teenage boys, teenage girls, put God first in your life. It will make a difference first for you. You're first accountable to God for yourself. And putting God first in your life will have an influence on others. Spouses, perhaps. Children, perhaps. Neighbors. People in the workplace. This world will be a better place. If there's anything we can say or do in meeting with you as we stand to sing a song and scheduling a time to spend time with you later perhaps or if you want to put Christ on in baptism to begin the act of faith, the Christian walk that takes us into eternity, let us know as we stand and sing.